Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you guys today is one that I'm really looking forward to hearing everybody's thoughts on. I feel like there's going to be a really good discussion on this case on whether you guys think this truly was a case of self-defense or if it's murder. But before we get into the case, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Ritual. I love Ritual. I've been using them for so long now. They are my go-to for their vitamins and their protein, but now they have a three-in-one prebiotic, probiotic, and postbiotic supplement to help support your gut, digestive, and immune health. Did you know that the top five best-selling gut supplements from the top five best-selling brands do not include a postbiotic? but you don't have to worry about that with Ritual. Prebiotics help support the growth and activity of beneficial bacteria within your gut. Probiotics are the live microorganisms that help to relieve bloating, gas, and occasional diarrhea. Then the postbiotic provides fuel to the cell that make up the gut lining to support the gut barrier function. Ritual uses two of the world's most clinically studied strain of probiotics with 11 billion CFUs for digestive support. Ritual's Symbiotic Plus comes in a one daily capsule that's scented with mint and a moisture controlled bottle to help protect the probiotic strains without the need to refrigerate them. Their capsules are also delayed release capsules, which are designed to reach the colon and not just the stomach, which is the ideal place for probiotics to survive and to grow. Plus, just like Ritual's other amazing products, their Symbiotic Plus has a clean formula that's vegan-friendly, formulated without GMOs, major allergens, animal products, or artificial colors. Start the new year off on the right foot with high-quality science-based products that you can trust. You can get 30% off of your first month with Ritual by heading to ritual.com slash rachels30 and use code rachels30. Again, that's ritual.com slash rachels30 and using code rachels30 for 30% off of your first month with Ritual. Thank you again so much to Ritual for partnering with me on today's video. Okay, so with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the tragic death of Peter Spencer. Peter Bernardo Spencer was born on August 30th, 1992 in Kingston, Jamaica to his parents, Eiklita Spencer Hunter and Conrad Spencer. Peter grew up in Jamaica, attending St. Andrew Technical High School there before moving to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 2013. According to those who loved him, Peter was a devoted Christian who lived his life showing compassion for others and helping others in any way that he could. He was a free spirit who loved to travel wherever and whenever he could, and he loved spending time with friends and family. He was known to be full of optimism, and his enthusiasm could be felt just by his presence. He was a strong believer of personal growth and self-awareness, and he pushed himself to always learn new things and to grow into the best possible version of himself. He surrounded himself with people who were hardworking and had big goals just like he did because he believed that that the people you surround yourself with is an extension of yourself. He was also known to love to give back. He would often cook meals with his mother at the Taste of Jamaica in Pittsburgh, and anytime there were leftovers, he would give them out to the homeless. He also had goals of someday opening a Jamaican restaurant someday with his mother, who he had a very, very close bond with. He was also known to love to play basketball with kids around the community. At the time of his death, he had been working in the fields of carpentry and plumbing and had just recently gotten his CDL license, which is a commercial driver's license that is needed to operate large and heavy vehicles such as semi-trucks. He was actually in the middle of taking classes for this and he only had one more exam left before being able to get a new job with his new license. Peter also had just recently gotten engaged to the love of his life, Carmilla King, and they found out that she was actually pregnant. So, before his death, his family said that he was working hard to provide the best life possible for his future bride and his future baby. He was so excited to be a father, to be a husband, to advance in his career. He had a lot of very positive things to look forward to in his life. He told Carmela that he wanted to start a new career to help support her and the new baby. 
He wanted to work hard to advance his career and buy them a house and to start working towards building generational wealth for the family. Peter also loved going outside, going camping, and doing outdoor activities with his friends. So there was one friend that he had who I believe is a past co-worker of his, though it's been reported that he was a current co-worker. I'm not exactly sure which one is true, but either way, they hung out together on a semi-regular basis, and they would go and do outdoorsy things together as well. I do believe Carmilla knew this friend, but it was more in passing. They have hung out in, you know, groups together and things like that, and he knew who he was, but Carmela wasn't, you know, super close with the friend. He didn't know a lot about him or anything like that. So, by December 11th of 2021, this friend had sent Peter a Snapchat asking him if he wanted to join him for a little outdoors camping trip at his parents' cabin in a small rural town in Emlinton, Pennsylvania, which was around two hours away from where he lived in Pittsburgh. This cabin was located in a pretty remote area along the Allegheny River. River. This was a relatively desolate area, but this whole thing seemed like a fun idea. Like I said, Peter really enjoyed being outside and being in the elements. Him and his friends had done things just like this in the past. They'd go out to the middle of absolutely nowhere, drink some beers, shoot off some guns, and just have a good time together. I want to note now that the friend who invited Peter over was a white man, and there were three other friends who were there that night, two men and one woman, I believe, and I don't think that Peter knew who these other people were, but they too were white so he was the only black man in presence at the cabin that night. In order to get to this cabin, you had to go down this random side road that wasn't really accessible via GPS, so you just sort of had to know where you're going or get directions from somebody who knows the area or something like that. The road doesn't even appear on Google Maps, so it really is just out in the middle of nowhere. Carmilla had driven him the just under two hours to the cabin, and of course, she was a little bit sketched out at just how isolated the entire area was, but once again, she knew that this was supposed to be a fun little trip with a couple of other guys, and she said that she'd be texting him throughout the entire trip, so this shouldn't be too much of an issue. She dropped Peter off at around 2 p.m. on December 11th, and then Carmilla turned around to head home, expecting to pick him up just a few hours later that same day. At the same time, she had Peter share his current location with her so that she would know exactly where to go to pick him back up because, once again, this was such a rural area that you really couldn't use a GPS to get to. At first, after dropping him off, it seemed like Peter was having a very good time. However, he had really spotty service, and again, the two shared their locations on Find My iPhone, but since the service was so bad, she couldn't see his location. This started to worry her, not only because she needed to get back to the cabin to pick him up later that day, but also for safety reasons so that she knows where he is and she knows that he's safe. A few hours after dropping him off and heading home, Carmilla got a text from Peter saying, I'm just gonna stay, come pick me up the next day. Right away, Carmilla thought that this was weird. She didn't know why the plans were suddenly changed or why he wanted to stay the night all of a sudden. She tried calling him, but once again, the service was pretty spotty, so she wasn't able to get a hold of him. So she texted him back saying, all right, be safe, I love you, and if you need me to come back tonight, I will but he did not reply to this text. She tried calling him and texting him multiple more times throughout the night, but all of this was going unanswered. She said that at the very least, Peter would have texted her back saying, I love you too, but he didn't even do that. She got so worried about him throughout that night that she even had his mother try to call and text him, but she also could not get a hold of Peter. Then she also tried to contact the friend slash coworker that Peter was with, 
but this person also would not respond to Carmela. By that next morning, when Carmela still hadn't heard from Peter, she said that she just had a hunch that something was wrong. She just had this gut feeling that something bad must have happened. So she got in her car and drove back over to the cabin, arriving at around 9 a.m. on December 12th. But as she was driving up to the cabin, Iclida, Peter's mother, had called her. Carmela said that Iclida told her to pull over because she didn't want to deliver the bad news while she was driving. But by the time she called, she was basically already at the cabin and she had already seen that there were state troopers' vehicles blocking the scene, and that is when Iclida told Carmela that Peter had actually passed away. Carmela saw the flashing lights from the police vehicles, the crime scene tape, and then she saw her fiancé's lifeless body laying on the ground. She described that she saw his body laying on his left side with his head pointed in the direction away from the residence as if he was headed towards the roadway and away from the cabin when he died. Obviously, she was completely devastated and heartbroken, but she had no idea what had just happened, so obviously, she wanted answers. It turned out that just before 2.30 a.m. on December 12th, police received a call reporting a shooting. When police arrived, immediately they found out that 29-year-old Peter Spencer was laying on the ground in the front yard of the residence with clear gunshot wounds to his body. Peter had been shot a total of nine times. Right away, there was a 25-year-old man who was identified as the main suspect, but none of the identities of anybody who was there were ever released. And shortly after questioning, he pretty much admitted right away that he was the one who shot Peter. However, this man was claiming that he shot Peter in self-defense. So, this man explained that the group of friends had just been having a really fun, normal time at this camping trip. Pictures later recovered from this man's phone showed that they had visited a waterfall, they went off-roading with ATVs, and then they ended their night by huddling around a campfire. Throughout the night, the man said that they had all smoked weed and all ingested mushrooms, including this man who was giving this report. Everything about the story that I'm about to tell you from here on out comes from the man who shot Peter. So, the man said that throughout the night, Peter started acting more and more erratically. He said that throughout the night, Peter started yelling and was saying that he was a god, that he was a creator, a master, and a manipulator of his own reality. He said that Peter then grabbed his own AK-47 and then started shooting into the air multiple times. Apparently, this AK-47 was an illegally owned gun and the serial number had been filed off, so I don't know if it had been obtained illegally or if it was illegal because the serial number had been filed off, but either way, this was an illegal gun. Then, this witness, who is referred to in police reports only as the shooter, said that Peter asked the group to gather more firewood in order to build a bigger bonfire, but then, after asking, he started demanding this. He said that the group was asking him to put down the gun multiple times, but they said that he couldn't be reasoned with at this point. When a man identified as Witness 1 tried to run and go to his car, Peter allegedly pointed the gun at him and then made him kneel to the ground, which he complied with. Then, another man identified as Witness 2 grabbed his keys to get into the bus that he had driven there, but Peter took his keys away from him. Then, the shooter said that Peter pointed the gun at him and repeatedly asked where the girl had gone. The girl in this situation is referred to as Witness 3. The shooter said that he lied to Peter, saying that she was in the cabin, when in reality, she was hiding under the bus. The shooter then told police that Peter had pushed him, demanding to know where this girl was. Then, Peter pointed his AK-47 at him. The shooter said that after pointing his AK at him, Peter threatened to shoot up the entire place. And that is when the shooter took out his own pistol and shot Peter nine 
times. After only an hour of these four individuals being questioned, police released them without any sort of charges. Police said that these people were within their rights due to Pennsylvania's Stand Your Ground law. This means that if someone reasonably believes that their life is in danger, they have the right to act with lethal force in order to save their own life. Upon examining the scene, police found multiple illegal guns on the property as well as illegal drugs. So, I have seen mixed reports on this, but I do know that the man whose parents owned the property had a past criminal history for possessing multiple illegal firearms and sanding off the serial numbers. They were also being investigated for having numerous ghost guns, which means that these guns are made privately using kits to build them. So, because they are built by the individual, they're not traceable, they don't have serial numbers, or any other identifiable characteristics. However, I've seen in most most reports that the AK-47 that Peter was using was his own and that he also brought an AR-15 to the trip. Again, this was common for them to go out and shoot guns in the middle of nowhere when they were outside, so it would make sense for the sake of this trip if Peter did bring those guns with him for that purpose. So, I'm not exactly sure what gun belonged to each person, but I am pretty sure that the illegal AK-47 with the serial numbers sanded off, that belonged to Peter. Now, I do want to mention that Peter did have his own criminal history. He had been charged with illegal weapon ownership and illegal possession of drugs, and I believe he was also being investigated for ghost guns. However, according to his family, these were things that he was trying to square away before his baby was born. I also do want to say that Carmela would later say that she did not see Peter grab any guns or take them with him for this trip, and if I'm being honest, those are very large guns and are difficult to hide. She did say, however, that she did purchase an AR-15 before, she did own one, so I don't know, once again, if this AR-15 in question is hers that he brought with him to this trip, or if it was a gun that was owned by the people who lived on the property. Again, this also means that we don't know for sure if this, you know, AK-47 belonged to Peter because when the serial number is not there, it's not traceable. So, the reason for me that it's so questionable is because when you buy a firearm, it comes with that specific serial number so they know that it is, in fact, your gun. But obviously, when there's no serial number, it could be anyone's gun at that point. So, I think that's why there's such big questions around whether or not these guns belonged to Peter or Carmela or if they belonged to the person on the property. I personally think that he probably did bring those guns with him just because, once again, it's not necessarily a bad thing if he did bring the guns with him. I think that because this was this type of, you know, shooting and camping trip, that's probably why he brought them. So, I don't know why someone would want to cover up that fact that he brought them. Maybe they don't want them to think that they're his because they are illegal. Either way, I do personally think that he brought them because, once again, like I've said multiple times, this was one of those trips where they were going to be shooting guns. So, looking at the scene, it was said that there were 31 spent shell casings from an AK-47 found at the scene. So, this confirms that at least somebody had been shooting off the AK that night. It was also found that Witness 1's cell phone was found in Peter's pocket when his body was initially examined. Now, going back to the original scene and what has been said about the involvement with drugs in all of this, upon entering the scene and questioning all individuals present, police determined that all four of them were alert, aware, and not acting in any sort of unusual way. Police determined that all four individuals were not under the influence at the time that these interviews took place. Like I said, though, the shooter told the officers that he had ingested mushrooms that night. However, later drug tests revealed that this man had no traces of drugs in his system. So, he was lying about the fact that he had taken mushrooms that night 
for whatever reason. Like I said, the witnesses said that Peter had taken shrooms and was smoking marijuana that day. According to his toxicology report, they did find that there was psilocin in Peter's system, which is the hallucinogenic substance that causes hallucination and gets you high from magic mushrooms. They said that this substance can also be known to cause panic attacks and psychosis. But the toxicology report also found that there was traces of fentanyl in his system. It was said that there was no mention of fentanyl ever made by any of the people involved in this situation, so it's thought that it's possible that the drugs that Peter did willingly take may have been laced with fentanyl. So now let's talk about what the autopsy found. It was found that there were a total of nine shots in Peter's body. There was one shot to his face, which was described as non-lethal, and then I believe four shots were found to the front or side of his body, and then three shots were in the back, and two shots were in his buttocks. The initial report stated that this type of shooting would have taken around 2 to 2.5 seconds. They said that the bullets entered from the front, and then they entered his side, his back, and his buttocks as Peter's body twisted away from the shooter as he fell to the ground. It was said by investigators that the shot to his face was not purposeful in the sense of it not being an execution shot, so it's not like someone went up to him and purposely shot him in the head. It seemed more so that this person was shooting off rounds anywhere to Peter's body and one of them happened to hit his face. Investigators said that he was found face down, not too far from the fire that was still going when investigators arrived. Their report found that he was not running away when the shots were fired. So this, in addition to the other things that were found at the scene, his death was ruled as a shooting by self-defense. Now, of course, as you can expect after this all came out, Peter's family were just in utter shock and disbelief. This was not the Peter that they knew. Like I said, he was known to be helpful, kind, and responsible. He had never been known to take anything like magic mushrooms before. Then we know that the shooter told investigators that he had taken mushrooms that night as well, but his toxicology screen showed that he hadn't. He was completely clean. I don't know if the others had been tested, if they didn't take mushrooms either, but if they didn't, why was Peter the only one that took mushrooms that night? Then again, we know that the shooter never mentioned anything about fentanyl, even though it was clear that there was fentanyl in Peter's system. So, police said that the witnesses at the scene were credible, but the family questioned how could they possibly be deemed credible when they were caught lying in the investigation. The family has also said that investigators just are not working with them, they aren't offering them any help, and they aren't giving them any sort of information. They believe that this may be a hate crime seeing as how Peter was the only black man in a group of white friends who he barely knew. Peter's sibling, Tila Spencer, wrote, quote, This is a hate crime. Peter was murdered in Rockland Township, Pennsylvania, in a backwater rural town where he was completely vulnerable and cut off from everything and everyone. He was slaughtered and killed in what I consider an act of modern-day lynching. The family also thought that there may be a racial bias on the part of investigators in this case. So, the family has asked for outside opinions. The family's lawyer hired a very well-known pathologist who all of you may recognize if you follow true crime, Dr. Cyril Wecht. Cyril Wecht is known for being a private pathologist who works with tons and tons, thousands of families who believe that law enforcement may have something to hide or may have been covering something up or maybe they simply came to the wrong conclusion. He's done autopsies in cases of John Benet Ramsey and Lacey Peterson, to name a few. Cyril Wecht is somebody who can offer these family an outside eye. Cyril Wecht said that according to his autopsy, like I said, it showed that he was shot five times to his backside. To Wecht, this indicates that he was running away and or turning away, yet the shooter continued to attack him. He said, quote, Where is the fear on the part of the shooter that he is being threatened? 
five shots at Mr. Spencer while he is moving away from the shooter, and the shooter is continuing to shoot. He also mentioned that there is one wound that has an entrance wound, but there is no exit wound, yet the bullet cannot be found in Peter's body. He basically said that bullets don't just disappear, so where is this mystery bullet? He said that you cannot tell just based on the bullet wounds themselves that he had twisted as he was being shot at, like I described earlier. He said, though, that if this is the case, there was no reason for the shooter to shoot Peter nine times. So, given all of that information, there are questions around whether this truly is a case of self-defense or if this is a murder. Now, like I said earlier, the shooter said himself that he had taken mushrooms that day, but his toxicology came back clean. So, my question is, is why did he lie about taking these drugs? If anything, him saying that he took shrooms before operating a firearm, that could have led him to getting into more trouble. So, if you're going to lie about anything while you know that you're using guns and things like that, shouldn't you say that you weren't on drugs if you were? I've never seen someone saying that they were on drugs when they, in fact, hadn't been on drugs unless it was after the fact and, you know, we've seen cases like that. So, was he lying to say that he didn't know what he was doing when he shot Peter? Or was Peter the only one that took drugs for whatever reason and they just didn't want police to know that? Because that is the big question that I have in this case. To be as fair and objective as possible in this case, we know that Peter did have hallucinogenic drugs in his system that is not arguable. So, it can reasonably be thought that he may have had some sort of psychotic episode or anxiety attack that maybe made him think that, you know, his friends were after him or something like that, and that is why he started to act completely irrational. But if he is the only one to have taken drugs that night, I have to ask why? What are these people hiding in this aspect? Did they drug him without his knowledge? Did they truly slip him that fentanyl? Did they do this as a part of some sort of weird hate crime where, you know, they weren't going to do drugs, but they gave drugs to this black man to see what would happen? Like I said, his family said that he has never taken anything like mushrooms or LSD in his life. So, why now? Why would he take them and then be the only person that took them? That doesn't make any sense to me. I also do have questions about the crime scene. I didn't see anywhere stated where the AK was found when investigators were on the scene. If you know more about this, please let me know, but I wonder, was the AK found near his body? Was he still holding it when he was found? Was it found several feet away or in a completely different location? This would tell us if he truly was holding the gun and pointing the gun when he was shot. This would be a huge piece of the puzzle that you'd think would be widely known, one of the first things that were stated, but I haven't seen it stated anywhere, so we don't know where the gun was. We don't know what the situation around that is, so that's just another question that I have that could make it much more likely if this truly was a case of self-defense. We know that the shooter had this past criminal history involving ghost guns and gun trafficking. We also know that Peter does also have charges related to this. Was this camping trip actually a situation involving this? Maybe these people invited him out there so that they could work together in some sort of operation. And then Peter said that he wanted out because he's trying to make a better life for his family. And then maybe some sort of argument took place that led to this. Maybe he knew too much about something serious that was going on with this group. And then, you know, Peter threatened to tell someone and they didn't want anybody to know what was going on with their operation. So they shot him. Maybe this day, you know, others were working on something that had to do with a gun operation or whatever, and Peter said that he wanted nothing to do with it, so the friend offered him drugs to do while they all worked on this, saying that they would meet up with him later, and then they all hung out later. 
Maybe he found something when he was on the drugs that made him react more strongly to something that he normally wouldn't have. Maybe he threatened the friends that he was going to tell everyone what they were doing because he wasn't thinking clearly and they didn't, you know, realize that this is just the drugs talking, so they didn't want whatever they were doing to get out, so they had to shoot him. Those who believe that there's more to this story believe that the friends probably didn't invite him out there with the intent to harm him from the get-go, but it's thought that maybe something went wrong while they were out there. Maybe they started arguing and they threatened each other. Maybe Peter grabbed the gun because he was the one being threatened. The family just thinks that there's more to this story. They think that it's no coincidence that he was the only black man there, that he was being portrayed as this violent aggressor that they know he isn't, and that he just happens to be the one that's murdered in this group of, again, all white people then the police in this area that is known to be over 90% white just let these people off with absolutely no charges. Even if they can't be charged specifically with Peter's death, there were still illegal guns and illicit substances found on the property, so why weren't they arrested and charged for that? If nothing else, shouldn't they at least be charged with the criminal activity that they were actually caught doing? His family said that they just think that Peter deserves justice. They said that at this point, they just want all of the answers to all of these unknowns in this case. I feel like the whole situation of self-defense would be a lot easier to accept had these people not lied about things in this case and had he not been shot nine times. I like to be completely objective in cases like this, so I actually do know what people will say to defend this shooter. I know there are a lot of people out there, self-defense people, who think that when your life is in danger, you don't take any chances. You shoot your entire magazine off and you don't stop until you know that you are safe because even if there are questions later, at least you still have your life. But at the same time, nine shots is a lot. There's really no reason for that ever, especially if you see that someone's already falling, especially if someone's turning away, especially if the gun is dropped. There's no reason for nine shots. That is a lot. Again, I do understand that this happened in a very short amount of time, according to the original autopsy. They said it literally happened within seconds, but with a semi-automatic pistol, you have to pull the trigger nine separate times. It's not like you can just hold it down and nine shots fly out. You have to pull it nine times. That is a lot of times. And again, I understand in that moment of wanting to feel safe, but nine times truly is excessive and nobody can convince me otherwise. And that is coming from someone who is a supporter of people owning firearms to protect themselves in their own homes. I own one. I am an even bigger supporter of women owning firearms, and that's not even related to this case, but I do still think that nine shots in a row is a lot, especially if you see that person go down. I just wish investigators would be more open with the family. I think this case would be a lot clearer and a lot easier for the family to accept if their questions were answered, if it could be explained to them why this person lied about different things, why he was shot so many times. But I think the fact that these questions are just not being answered and nobody seems to want to answer them, that's what really makes me wonder if something truly is going on with this case. I do think it's possible that Peter took the drugs that night thinking that, you know, it would be a fun night or whatever. I don't personally think that he purposely took the fentanyl because I can understand going from things like drinking and smoking weed to wanting to try shrooms. I personally haven't. I would never do that, but I have plenty of friends who have wanted to try shrooms and who have after only, you know, smoking weed their entire life. But I think it's a huge leap to go from weed to fentanyl. You guys tell me more if you have more experience with it than I do, but I think that that's a very big leap to jump from weed, which is something that's legal in a ton of states, something that a lot of people do, all the way to fentanyl, which is very lethal in very, very small amounts. So, I think that he could have had some horrible reaction to this drug, and that is why he acted completely out of character, whether he was genuinely scared because of how the drugs were making him feel, 
or if he found out something or if he felt that something was off with his friends that made him act out of the ordinary from already being a little bit paranoid to now very, very paranoid. Again, being 100% transparent and fair here, I can see how drugs like this can make someone act completely irrational and completely out of character. Someone who goes from giving back, from, you know, being a future husband and a future father to all of a sudden acting like this and shooting off rounds into the air and threatening people, I can see how drugs can make people act that way if they're really, really that paranoid or if there's any sort of underlying mental health issues, things like that, which I don't know about. I'm just saying as a generality, not in this case specifically, but I can see how this could happen in this case. But I also think that there are aspects of this case that need to be investigated further, no matter what the situation is, no matter how believable these witnesses are, no matter how believable their story is, there are certain things that need to be investigated, that need to be relayed to the family so that they can sleep at night knowing that this truly was just a really horrible situation and that their son, you know, fiance, brother was not just hunted because of his race. I think that that's one of the worst things that you can possibly think happened to your loved one. So I think if a lot of these unanswered questions were just answered and things were just looked into more, I think that could give the family a lot more peace of mind as to what's really going on and to allow them more peace and comfort about this situation. But either way, no matter what this situation was, no matter what the reason was, there is now a baby without a father. There's a mother who had to face this horrible tragedy and raise her baby the best that she possibly can completely by herself. I can't even imagine how difficult this entire thing must have been for Carmela. I just wish this never happened. Peter seemed so excited to be a father. He was so excited to just work hard and provide for those who he loved most. He was a family man and this one night, this one time of whatever happened, ended it all. Whether he did have some sort of psychosis that made him act completely out of character or if something more sinister happened. Just talking about this now, I just want to know at the end of this video, I think it's possible that if he had never done drugs like this before, that maybe this was seen as like a last hurrah before becoming a father and a husband. And he's like, you know what? I'm just going to try this drug that I've never tried before because I'm not going to be able to do it once my baby's born. So I can see that as a reason that he wanted to take it if nobody else did. But once again, there's no reason to lie about it. So that is where I will leave that. That's pretty much all of the information that I have for today's case. And now I want to know what your guys' thoughts are. I am truly looking forward to hearing what all of you have to say about this case. I want to know if you do truly think this was a hate crime. Do you think this was something out of self-defense or do you think there's more at play here? Let's discuss in the comments below. Either way, if you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Don't forget to go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And make sure you head to ritual.com slash rachels30 and use code rachels30 for 30% off of your first month with Ritual. If you have absolutely any case suggestions for any case that you'd like to see covered on this channel, make sure you go ahead and use my Google form that I have listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.